Welcome to the session, Producing in the City. This is going to be the best session of them all. We have a lot of great speakers and startups pitching. To and I'm going to add Felix on the screen. Uh, Felix, Hi, Daniel. Felix, it's great to see you. Uh, Felix Chang is joining us from Hong Kong. He's the founder and CEO of Ixon Food Technology. And um, he's going to pitch what they're doing, and it's really exciting. And, uh, and then we'll do a little Q&A. Do feel free to, uh, to uh, put uh, your questions in the chat box on your right. Uh, Felix, uh, you do have some slides. Do you want to share them on uh, your screen? Sure. Um, let me see how to do this. OK. Yep. So the floor is yours, Felix. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to present in front of everyone. The organizer asked me to give a talk on producing in the city, uh, especially in Hong Kong, which is quite strange if you think about it, because Hong Kong is, um, is a city with no agriculture. Uh, and so uh, all our meats is actually imported from uh, around the world. So uh, you might think, um, what's there for us to produce? So, um, uh, and also to give you a, um, a clearer detail of our city situation, Hong Kong has one of the highest meat consumption per capita in the world. We eat uh, four times the amount of meat uh, than UK and, and also the uh, four times the amount of seafood than UK. As a matter of fact, you might be surprised. We are the second largest uh, consumer of seafood in the world, more so than um, South Korea and Japan, uh, only second to uh, um, Maldives. So uh, this shows how much meat Hong Kong people like eating. Um, and, and so, you know, that's really bad for the environment because as we all know, um, uh, it takes a lot of energy and water for us to produce the meat. And the situation is even worse because Hong Kong, 99% of our meats, this includes the fresh meats, chilled meat and frozen meats are imported uh, uh, from uh, other countries. So our fresh and chilled meats, irrespective of whether it's beef, pork or chicken, they mainly come from uh, China, mainland China, uh, for the frozen uh, pork, uh, that's also from China. Uh, frozen beef, 40% comes from Australia, 30% comes from US, uh, and 20% comes from Brazil. So this is just some of the numbers to show you how much um, uh, carbon emissions the Hong Kong people have been like um, uh, uh, spending in order to get our meat into uh, our, our city. So the, the logical solution would be to eat less meat. But let's not forget, meat is an important part of the human diet for the last 1.5 million years. Meat has um, important protein, uh, nutrients, and it's packed with energy. That's actually critical for children's growth and development. Studies have shown that uh, with, uh, with, uh, in a diet with a uh, with little meat, children grow up weaker, um, smaller, and, and less strong. So um, as a scientist, uh, we have uh, uh, my co-founder Elton and also I, uh, when we were at the Hong Kong Baptist University, we developed a technology that we hope can help the meat industry and the food industry solve all these problems. The technology is called ASAP which is short for Advanced Sous Vide Aseptic Packaging. In short, the technology enables the storage of fresh meats at room temperature for up to two years. The reason why, uh, so this is a picture of, um, of uh, some of our products. The yellow liquids that you see here um, is extra virgin olive oil. The meat is the Canadian pork chop. So after we package it, you can store this um, meat in your cupboard, in your pantry with that refrigeration, and it will last for a long time. And the reason why we can do that is because our technology also sterilizes the meat at the amazingly low temperature of 60 degrees. So if you cut open that pork chop right now, it's actually medium rare, juicy, and tender. 
So here's a photo of um, some of the meats that we served in a London event last October. We shipped from Hong Kong to London um, and uh, we stored it in the hotel for a month prior to serving. And uh, as you can see, once you cut open the meats, it's actually tender, juicy, pink. And all we needed to do was give it a light sear. And the meat is extremely tasty. Everyone who tasted our meat said it was the best piece of uh, steak they've ever tasted. And luckily, they all survived. Um, so uh, we have opened a factory, a pilot factory in Hong Kong to produce this meat. Uh, we feel that this is, um, as a Hong Kong scientist, this is our part for the world where we help reduce the carbon emission by inventing a technology that can help preserve meat and also reduce carbon emission by allowing um, the shipment of meat at room temperature. Um, the capacity at the moment is around 50 kilograms per day. Everything is done manually. It's quite labor intensive. So this is why our next goal is to go complete automation to create a production line that will be scaled to mass production. And we are currently working with um, companies like Sealed Air, Ecolab, Cargill, um, and Amadori in order to commercialize this technology. So what are the benefits? Well, this technology is going to help us solve so many problems facing the food industry. Number one, food safety. So with our technology, we have created meat that is not just clean, but 100% sterile. Also, you are talking about extended shelf life at room temperature, not for days or weeks, but up to years. So this is like the ultimate in food preservation technology. Also, by protecting all the meat from spoiling, you essentially have increased the amount of meat available to feed the population by 33%. So suddenly, eating meats become sustainable. So uh, our technology is the most energy efficient food preservation method known to date. It uses 30% less energy than canning and 80% less energy than freezing. So it's really good for the environment. And with ASAP, you can create Michelin star dishes um, in the matter of seconds in a, in a hotel or in a restaurant settings. And you don't need much kitchen space. Because the meat has been stored at room temperature, you cook from room temperature instead of like freezing temperature. So this saves a lot of time and you also eliminate um, the wastage of energy once again. So I think this technology, when it's scale up, it's going to really help us get through uh, future disruptions in the food supply system. As we all know, uh, with the experience of the COVID um, the, our food supply system has been quite unsafe, stable. Many countries produce their meats or other food and uh, it has to be wasted because there's no way for us to preserve them. So we hope that by commercializing the ASAP technology, we can contribute to saving the world and be prepared for the next pandemic. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Felix. That's uh, super exciting. Do you have any do you have any concerns regarding the rise of alternative proteins? Uh, we've seen the success of Omni pork in in your part of the world. Um, do you have some concerns that this may may take away the mar potential market for for your product? Well, number one, we are actually working towards applying this technology for alternative protein. Um, but the difficulty, the challenge is that a core part of our technology uses surface sterilization, but the um, uh, alternative protein, it's more like minced meat. So this, like the surface uh, bacteria all gets uh, mixed up into the uh, into inside of the alternative protein already. But we are working on ASAP 2.0 to, to apply on the alternative protein. And I think like, you know, when you tackle um, major problems, sometimes you need more than one solution. Mm -hmm. And we feel that like, even though you have the alternative protein as an option, there will always be people who feel like that they want to eat the conventional meat products. So using our technology, we are giving people the best of all worlds. You can enjoy the taste of real meat, but being sustainable at the same time. And if, if, 
people sort of want to become fellow travelers on this journey, what would be most helpful to you? What are sort of your big asks uh, right now? Right. So um, uh, at the moment, uh, well, actually for a start, um, this is, uh, we are running a Kickstarter campaign next month where we are offering like 1,000 pieces of um, sirloin steak. So this is a, a Sweden food tech big meats exclusive. So these are some of the products that we have made um, using our packaging technology. So this is a US sirloin steak that you can put in your cupboard. And if you open it, you have a 10 ounce sirloin steak packed in extra virgin olive oil and you can um, grill it and it will taste exactly like a conventional piece of meat. So um, the, I, the objective of this uh, Kickstarter campaign is to demonstrate the traction and the market potential and hopefully raise a small capital to partially contribute to the building of our um, automated production line. So for the people who are watching this presentation, your support can go a long way into pushing the meat industry to adapt this technology and become greener and more environmentally friendly. Thank you so much, Felix. Uh, I know we're running on a tight schedule. We'd love to speak with you for hours, but I'm sure uh, we're going to see more of you uh, going forward. So, so thank you so much. Thank you um, so much, Daniel. So now I have the pleasure of uh, bringing on Masa Toshi Funabashi of the Sony Computer Science Labs uh, in Japan. Uh, it's great to have you here. Um, and I do think you will share some slides with us, Masa. Uh, on the screen here, you will have a little uh, symbol of a crossed over screen. So if you click that, you should be able to share your screen. Yeah, thank you. And nice to meet you, Daniel. And yeah, um, I, I'm trying to share the screen. And they just clicked on share. And can you see um, my laptop um, screen on your side or? It was not working. So if it's not working, I have to ask you. I, I say um, now previously yeah yeah I'm, I'm happy to share your slides so uh hopefully you can see the slides from here now and everyone you can double click to maximize the video so the floor is yours masa okay thank you daniel and hi everyone um i must have nabashi from sony computer science lab well i'm not from the lab i'm i'm from my home actually it's it's 9 35 in at night in Japan. So let me start my presentation. Um, okay, can you go to the next slide, Daniel? Well, I had that session title is producing in the city and people tend to talk about much product, uh, food production and um, distribution preservation and you know eliminating food loss and so on. But um, first of all, if we look at uh, the global picture of food production, um, the main problem is that we are losing the natural ecosystem into the farmland. And this picture shows how our human impact, mainly from agriculture, is affecting the land ecosystem. So the place where there is um, red color, um, red oriented graduation is where we have more impact of uh, human activity and mainly agriculture and what is green is somewhere um, remained intact but you can see the green part is just like Sahara desert or in the middle of Australia which is also the desert or in the northern part of Siberia that are you know <laughs> completely um, uh, frozen so basically you cannot convert them to, to the agricultural land so this means um, whatever degree uh, human activity is uh, using the land into agriculture, it's causing a severe loss of biodiversity. What we have in the image is that this is caused by the large scale monoculture production. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, as you can see, um, many pictures like this on the media. Okay, the large scale monoculture um, food production 
is of course a problem for the biodiversity loss and agricultural pollution, but this is uh, representing only about 30% of uh, the total problem. And the major problem lies um, in, in the total um, scale of fruit producers. I mean, uh, about 90% of people who are producing food are small holders. So people are cultivating uh, in small land, in, in family owned, um, not even companies, it's a, it's a family owned uh, farmers who are working uh, on about 70% of the, uh, who are producing up to 80% of the world food and working on 90% uh, of ag agriculture holdings by number. So uh, as you can see in the picture, the real problem is well behind the um, apparent large-scale monoculture. It's rather in our daily life or in the rural side that people uh, believe that it's somehow um, ecological or environmental fringy, but those people are still um, relying on monoculture method and if it sums up to, to a large surface, a large quantity of food, its consequence is the severe loss of biodiversity. So um, if you want to really change the demography um, of food production or producing massive impact by accumulating those small impacts into, into a large uh, sum globally, we need to tackle small scale farming that I call snake culture. So it's the abbreviation of synergistic co-cultivation, and it is based on the recovery and augmentation of biodiversity. And here in this small plot of about 1,000 square meters that uh, I'm collaborating in Japan, we put about 200 and more edible species, plant species, and in a very high dense um, mixed polyculture. So it's not like um, the usual monoculture field where you have a few crops that is rotating and everywhere it's it's stealing and repeating it. It's more like uh, a chaotic mixture of 200 um, edible plants, including vegetables, uh, medicinal herbs, and fruit trees. Uh, you cannot see where the fruit trees here because it's the picture in November and usually it's the beginning of winter in Japan. But as you can see, it's all covered with green on the surface. And usually in Japan, uh, in November, everything is, is kind of uh, dried out. There are, there are no green on the su production surface in agriculture, but in our field, we have this kind of rich uh, reserve of um, edible plants. And we are doing, doing the, um, the manual harvest out of it and to make a viable solution for what smallholders. And the principle is that uh, it follows the ecological succession. But uh, usually ecological succession is a term used to describe the natural um, succession of, of the forest, for example, beginning from the bare land into grassland and then shrub and then um, sh shed in torrent trees, so uh, those who light the sun, the sun. And then it goes to the uh, final transition towards the climax phase. So it's a mixture of high trees and underneath there's uh, trees that uh, do not tolerate the sun. And this is the general image of ecological succession. And in snake culture, we also follow this, na follow this natural rule, but we add a lot of edible plant species in it. And we also control the succession stage. So if you want uh, your edible forest, you can just uh, go on and it until the next phase. But if you rush land or shrub, you can also stop it by uh, doing uh, more uh, harvest on that. So that's a principle. And we eliminate the um, agriculture. I mean, there's no, no external fertilizer, and it includes organic fertilizer. So it's not even organic practice. We eliminate all external uh, fertilization. And also, we don't use agrochemicals. So everything is self-organized as a natural ecosystem, and it's making uh, quite a thick ecosystem. And to change a bit of the perspective and to introduce the good point of it, uh, I want to introduce, uh, I started 
in sub-Saharan Africa in 2015. So it's been like five years I'm collaborating with the local energy or in Burkina Faso. And Burkina Faso, in the, this picture, it's almost like desert and it's very dry. Although there's a rainy season, um, the rain is very violent during the rainy season. So it's causing flood and during the dry season, it looks like in this picture, so everything is dried out and, and you cannot see green vegetation. So it's a very harsh condition on which we started the experiment. So next slide, please. Yeah, so this is the initial stage of experiment. Uh, I collaborated with the local NGO and gathered 150 kinds of edible plants that was uh, locally available. Um, it's from also the, the seed market, uh, also we went on to pick some uh, local native plants that are edible and that were used in traditional uh, recipe and then integrated in, in the field. And the result was very significant. So on the right side, you can see uh, the kind of initial stage. So it was like totally built and the natural regeneration of ecosystem was impossible. And if you look at on the left side, it's, um, the actually uh, the same kind of um, ecosystem just one year after uh, the start of experiment so you can see the thick layer um, of edible plants and everything is edible in it so uh, we had really a significant result and the productivity was one or two orders of magnitudes higher than than the conventional um, farming but we also tested conventional farming and also some other alternative method, uh, like organic method. And also we also obtained the national uh, statistics, the official statistics from FAO to compare. And this is the brief summary of result. And the good thing is that not only we could produce a tremendous amount of edible food on site in this degraded land, it could also massively recover the ecosystem. Although it is like pinpoint ecosystem that is in small scale, it's already affecting a very good um, effect um, on, on the surrounding uh, field. And we are expanding this uh, experiment in, in not only in Burkina Faso, but in, in the neighboring countries like in Mali and also Togo, we study this kind of experiment in a more large scale. So getting back to the production in the city, um, what we are trying to do in Japan is to extract the principle of snake culture. So the principle is how the ecosystem is self-organized and producing um, not only the biomass, but fertile, becomes fertile. And there's a construction of ecosystem network that is connected to, to other ecosystem agents like other plants and insects in the surrounding environment. And it's making a very robust network so all this relationship uh, is something that I, we call ecosystem literacy or ecological literacy that we do not necessarily learn in, in our education system today. But it is quite easy if we can just you know, cut out uh, a, a smallest piece of snickoculture fuel into a planter, like in, in this picture, you can actually observe how diversity is affecting the soil quality, for example, and that's the principle of this um, kit that we call. And um, if we propagate this kind of learning experience in the city, uh, we can have a kind of ecological network between other field or wildlife sanctuary near the city. Um, so everything become connected and it will provide more fruitful experience. And the idea behind this kit is that what we can achieve with this kind of ecological literacy education is not only producing food, it's also producing information. Because this kind of mixed horticulture experiment is very difficult. We need a lot of information. It's not like you can plant a single kind of plant and pour water and then it grows. Because a single or individual plant could be very weak, but it could survive in unison with the environmental ecosystem. So that's the magic of, of um, 
plant ecosystem that, that is called a plant community, actually. So it, it's like tumor, you cannot survive alone, but if there's a society, you can uh, more or less uh, have chance to, to survive and being social. And plant as well, even if it's not adapted to monoculture, there's a bigger chance, but very complex um, way to, to adapt and survive in such community. And to experiment all that, uh, we set up the experimental field in the city environment, which is at the top of um, Ropongi Hills building, as you can see in this slide. It's um, actually in, uh, on top of skyscraper uh, in, the, uh, in the middle of Tokyo. So it's kind of, you know, very ideal experimental field uh, for city um, production, but we are not only producing food, we are producing a lot of information and try to use this information for other practitioners inside of the city of Singapore culture or uh, for other purpose like the, uh, the database of how the plants are associated. And if we provide this kind of information to other rural farmers in the same condition, they can replicate they can directly go to the uh, production of food, for example. So the limitation in, inside of the city is that we don't have necessarily so much land surface, so we are very limited in quantity, but it is very useful for producing information. And this information can be used in larger surface in rural area for food production. And also this information is very useful for the education, especially for the next generation for kids, for example. And each year we are holding the online uh, workshop um, for kids to diffuse better this principle. And yeah, so far we are not going very far um, other than uh, doing the workshop in, in the city environment as for the production in the city. Um, but we are hoping to have some collaboration with local chef, for example, how we can cook this food and this is going to be another workshop and you know the expanded knowledge of utility of what is produced because uh, if you have 150 species in a plot most people don't know how to cook it but it is producing a high quality uh, plant which can be served as a high quality food and high quality um, uh, recipe and for this uh, we are still taking ways to, to expand our activity. So I stopped my talk uh, here, and I'm basically a scientist, so I'm doing scientific research. And if you are interested in more scientific rationale behind this project, please visit the, the reference, and I also put it on, on the chat. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Masa. Very fascinating to see what you're trying to uh, what you're trying to develop it's it's really uh, fantastic and I know we're out of time for your session but I also know that uh, you have a colleague um, Shuntaru Arutake uh, who runs Suneko Robotics uh, who's been working with you in the Sony lab and um, I think uh, Shuntaru if you are here in the session it looks like you're here uh, please request access to share your screen because now we're going to start with some um, startup pictures. So uh, Masa, thank you so much for, for joining. I'm sure you'll stick around for a few minutes in the chat if anyone has questions for you. Uh, so domo arigato. And I will bring on uh, Shuntaro. Hopefully he'll pop up here. There we go. Beautiful. Hello. Konnichiwa. Hi, Shontaro, how are you? I'm great. How, how are you, Daniel? So, um, you're the first of a couple of startup pitches. You should be able to share your screen. On your screen, there's a little crossed over icon of a screen. If you click okay. that one, you should be able to share your screen. Okay, I'm trying to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Can you see that? My yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's working. So, you have uh, two minutes. 
Okay, hey, okay, okay, thank you very much. And so thank you for the introduction, Daniel. And hello everyone, um, I'm Sean from the Sun CSL and a member of the Snow Coach project, which was previous presenter, uh, Masa has presented. And uh, what I'm doing is the Snow Robotics, uh, which is a robotics that achieves the auto diversification by Snow Culture and also collaborating with the solar power plant company. So, um, okay, uh, first of all, I would like to share our activity at, in the solar power plant. As you can see, the land is devastated and there is no life at all. But with the snow culture implementation and after one and a half years, um, the ecosystem has begun to regenerate and we harvest this some like looking delicious veggies and also like this cute froggy um, has joined our ecosystem recently. So um, this is what I'm developing, the robotics that supports and works snow culture together with the human. So, and, and on this project, I aim to green the desertified areas and produce both electricity and the energy for the human to live. And this robot, uh, robotics um, has um, like a collective management of crops with uh, one unit by changing the several tools and it is designed to run individually so that it can work not only under the solar panel but also outside too. And right now we have completed the robotics hardware creation and going to start the field experiment at the solar power, uh, power panel site next month. And um, what is the critical with this project is that uh, this Robotics is not just um, like a automatic farming robot. The biggest problem with this like a global environment or in like a food problem is that the belief that everyone has that human being cannot live without exploiting from the ecosystem. But as uh, the experiment of the massa shows at the snap culture, um, like a human beings can become the first living species that can augment the ecosystem and could live with that way. And, and so that's why I'm creating the ro robotics that could augment the ecosystem with human. And also like I'm creating the XR that could construct the cyber ecosystem that digitalizes the ecosystem. And by integrating them all, like I am to achieve the augmented human ingenuity. And also like I'm thinking that this sort of robotics will be the new hub in an empty and also like a non-electric and like a devastated area and will support to expand the number of people engaging in snow culture and will construct a kind of like a small ecosystem and it is not only that by organically like a connecting these hubs and like urban i'm thinking that it could construct kind of like a powerful like a ecosystem and, and finally, um, my goal is to create a new industry that is based on the social and the ecological common capital and change to the sustainable world. Okay, and that's it for my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm curious to understand how, how far is this from market? And when do you think you'll be able to, to, to bring this to market, whether it's pilots or, or actually mm. realization? Well, like uh, right now, like this robotics is that the, just the hardware is um, com just a completed in, and also like it is still in the R and D um, section. So, um, well, like, um, and like uh, from this month, like it, it's going to be on the experiment on the field. So, um, well, also like it needs uh, like a the. The difficulty part is that the, the sensing part, you know, um, I mean like XR, and like uh, we have been developing that, but um, it is getting to be um, some kind of the, um, the output. So I'm thinking like, um, like uh, by having experiment on like uh, African also after like uh, like uh, next year or the also like two years. And I hope um, this, I, I want to uh, like make this, to the market like uh, three years, in three years or so. Okay, so what we hopefully uh, think your technology can enable is, is working mm -hmm. with Senegal culture, it can turn a desert into a uh, blooming field uh, for yes. food and, and, and life. So that sounds mm -hmm. pretty wonderful. Um, our, our five minutes uh, are up, uh, so thank you so much for joining and pitching and please stick around in the chat if people have questions for you. And 
I'm going to say domo arigato and uh, okay <laughs> and we will okay. bring our next speaker on stage which is Alvin Ponet from Local Food Nodes in uh, Sweden. Welcome Alvin. You Thank have you have uh, the ability to show some slides if you click on the slide share on your screen. Yes, thank you very much for having me, guys. Uh, my name is Albin Ponot, and I'm the founder of the project called Local Food Nodes, which is a digital platform, a mobile app where you can interact as the local food producers straight to the end consumers. So we had created a web store where you, as a producer, can make available your produce, take pre-orders straight from the consumers, and then you go meet one another in specific locations and uh, deliver the product, change money for, for the products without any intermediaries. So you don't pay anything thing through our platform. You make the business on the side. Um, so you keep 100% of the revenue yourself as a producer. So we are not running a business as such, or we're more running a, a project to develop society and how producers can engage, create real relations, own 100% of the revenue share themselves. Uh, to be put in the driver's seats of, of their own business. Uh, so we are donation-based, kind of like Wikipedia. So if you like the service, you can donate whatever feels right for you to use the service. And we have about 13,000 downloads of the app so far. We are spread, starting to spread in uh, various countries. We have some nodes created in Italy yesterday. We have a workshop with South Africa a couple of days ago. We have notes in the US, uh, actually a couple in Japan as well. So uh, it's starting to happen things with, with the project. And we've been up and running for about four years. And we're two, two people doing this when we find the time. Um, yeah, and I can share the link to both the app and the website as we go. So that's basically what we're doing. We're creating a web shop where you do not pay for the party to do that outside of the web, uh, straight to the producers. And do, do you have any sense how much trade in terms of volume or, or uh, tons of fruits and vegetables you're enabling? And, and is this mainly a thing in Sweden or are you also available in other countries, your, your local food nodes? The platform is available in various countries and we also have a translation tool so anyone can translate the platform and people are doing it. Uh, we have metrics. May, mainly how many nodes, how many producers, how many locals using it. We are about to create other metrics that people can track and see how much has been sold and so on. We haven't come that far yet, but it it will be there to be to be gathered as uh, as metrics to do whatever you want to do with it, as long as they're not personalized. Um, so this is an open open source project, and at the moment we are two people working on it. And hopefully we can. Uh, on board more people that would like to contribute with whatever translations, code, or, or what, what not to the project. And a final question, what, what do you hope this will enable? If you're successful and, and the world starts using local food nodes and to, to trade uh, produce locally, what do you hope this will enable for our food system? I hope it will enable that you create real life firsthand relations between real people in the local communities. Maybe you don't need our app within a five or 10 years time because then you have those relations uh, built up. So we aim for that you should get access to good local foods where you are at and you should have good real relations with the farmers in your local community. And if an app can help put that in place, then we're here to do that. So we're, we're not based on, on an idea, we're based on a need so we listen in the needs of various producers and create those features they are in need of to make this happen in their local context. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Alvin. Uh, please do stick around for questions in the chat. Uh, mm -hmm. I see someone already posted a question for you. So say, thank you so much, Alvin Pornet from Local Food Notes. Uh, thank you. Now, thank you. Now, uh, hopefully, we can bring on stage Natalie the Bruin from Grenska, which is a local vertical farm. Uh, Natalie, I see you're in the chat. Uh, feel free to request access to uh, the screen so we can bring you up here on the main stage, Natalie. 
So she's one of the co-founders. Uh, she, she used to be an economist and, and founded this company four years ago uh, with her uh, two partners, and they have 12 employees today, developing technology for vertical farming, but also, of course, growing produce uh, outside or inside close to the city. And she used to work with space technology before uh, starting Grönska. So Natalie, if you are here, please uh, request screen access uh, so you can pitch. Um, and in the meantime, I can just say that we're gonna, shortly we're gonna do a break. After the break, we're gonna have the founder and CEO of uh, Solar Foods, Dr. Pasi Weinecke. We're gonna have a couple of friends from the UN in Rome, uh, as well as two exciting startup pitches, uh, Cold Hubs of Nigeria and Gourmet, uh, cellularly grown foie gras from France, and as well as the managing director of food uh, from the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, so Natalie, this is your final call. Uh, I, I can't uh, just force you to go on screen. Uh, so you have to request access to the screen uh, to pitch. Uh, but I can't, I'm not sure if you're hearing this or seeing this. So uh, why don't we call this a break for 10 minutes? So uh, a little bio break for 10 minutes and then please come back for, for the rest of the session. Should be really exciting. Thank you very much. Hello everyone. We are back for the session producing in the city. And uh, first of all, I just chatted with Natalie of uh, Grönska, the vertical indoor farm company. There were some technical issues um, obstructing her from uh, joining the session. So she sends her regards. She's in the chat if you want to chat with her. Uh, now, however, I have the pleasure of uh, introducing the co-founder and CEO of uh, Solar Foods in Finland, Dr. Pasi Vainikka. Um, Pasi used to work for VTT, Technical Research Institute of Finland, where he led some really cool projects, including the largest ever sustainable or renewable energy project in, in, in research in Finland. Um, and he's here with us today to share for a couple of minutes what Solar Foods is uh, up to. So vel welcome very much, Fasi. Thank you. And um, I, I, I do think, I, I mean, I can, we have a little beautiful, uh, I think, Finnish uh, sunset or something that we can uh, share in the background here. We can actually go without too. I'm we'll go there. without. Okay, yeah, so we'll go with that. The, the floor is yours, Pasi. Uh, Wallace with Solar Food. Yeah, I thought that I would like to, to draw your interest to something very interesting. What I've learned uh, in, in the past couple of years of being an entrepreneur in the, in the uh, food space. Um, as we speak, uh, foundations for a completely new sector in the global economy are being laid. And in my view, the food sector is in the same situation today as the information and communication technology or, or personal computing was in the late 80s. Um, this has not been left unnoted uh, by those uh, who contributed to establishing what we understand today by, by uh, e-commerce, online gaming or, or social media, the ICT and app industry as a whole. And um, as a re uh, result of a very recent development, uh, billions of dollars are being invested every year by the professional venture capital industry to a new emerging a sector in the global economy called food technology. Cards are being dealt to those who uh, will lead the humankind to the new era of food production. Um, historically, when there has been simultaneous leap in both communication and food availability, uh, these together have led to restructuring of the society and the humankind has reached to a new level. Um, you know, if we go to 100,000 years ago, back, uh, we learned to cook food on open fire, the brain got more en uh, energy and protein, uh, and the spoken language was developed, uh, uh, resulting to, to restructuring of the society to tribes and later on perhaps ending to, to what we call city-states. Then we learned about 10,000 years ago to practice agriculture. 
suddenly we had some spare time, we had a lot of energy, food, um, and, and Stone Age ended, and, and the, the uh, written language was developed, and the society was able to restructure again uh, to, to what we could, for example, describe ending to, to, uh, to Roman Empire. Now we have uh, lived the third wave recently, which is the industrial era. We had suddenly a lot of fossil fuels as the energy source. We learned to make fertilizers and basically the hectare yield of food production uh, exploded. Uh, and, and in information and communication, there was TV uh, and radio that ended up to, to what we call globalization. Now I claim that we are entering the fourth wave with the internet and in particular the social media, a new layer of information through mobile devices. Um, anyone uh, or everyone has access to all the information in the world real time for free. So that's the new information structure what we have. And I believe we're experiencing the first impacts of this fourth wave of communication in our societal structures, whatever it will be. But perhaps demonstrate it uh, again in the, in the approaching uh, presidential election in the US, the impact of social media and stuff. Meanwhile, in food tech, uh, in these times when technology is developing probably faster than ever, in just a handful of years, the man has learned how to produce milk without cow, egg without chicken, and meat without killing. Solar foods is one example of this development. We have developed platform technology through which we can provide a new harvest, a completely new protein to the humankind. I mean, in, in these most, uh, these times, some say post-truth times, uh, with, with multiple simultaneous environmental conflicts where, where uh, alternative facts are being spread, it is of utmost importance scientists step forward and show uh, science is like magic but real. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Pasi. Um, that was a really high level intro to uh, the development of humankind, but I'm, 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 I'm more. I'm even more interested in, in solar foods. So basically, for those of you out there who don't know solar foods, solar foods is able to combine air and electricity and organisms to essentially produce protein. Um, and, and you just received a quite sizable investment as well. So tell us about the protein you're producing. Um, what, what's the sort of elevator pitch and, uh, and what does it taste like? Our gift to the society is this connection or delinking food production from agriculture and aquaculture. We don't use any agriculture inputs. What we do is basically similar to winemaking. In winemaking, you have fermenter, you add uh, sugars liquid originating from agriculture through grapes uh, that yeast eats basically to grow and then make alcohol surrounding liquid. So this is the classical sugar-based fermentation with, with yeast. We do technically the same, but our organism, naturally occurring microbe uh, found in the um, environment, um, this microbe does not eat sugar, but we feed in the fermenter instead of sugars, small bubbles of hydrogen and carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide we capture from the air with a direct air capture technology and um, hydrogen which is the energy source instead of sunlight or sugar, uh, we make with electrolysis of water. So we split water with, by using electricity and that's where the energy is charged. And then we run this fermentation continuously, take the product liquid out, uh, you dry it and you, you end up with a powder that is, I would say, roughly speaking, almost identical to soy, 65% protein, carbs and fats, vitamins and stuff. And what, Pasi, what do you hope, what's your aspiration regarding what this will enable for the way we produce and distribute and consume foods in the future? And, and when will this hit the market in a big way? We aim to be on the market in 30 months. Uh, we are investing with the new Series A funding uh, to what we call a demonstrator. So it's a real first commercial factory, but a small one like a, a microbrewery uh, and um, we need a novel food permit so that is something what we need to apply with the permit and building the first factory we are about 30 months from uh, from uh, from the market in our view we do produce uh, a 
powder. Uh, and we see it as a, as a platform ingredient for existing foods wherever they appear today or in plant-based meat and dairy alternatives, basically bringing back the nutritional value to compare that to the animal-based uh, uh, nutrition. Um, and in the, forward in the future, if cultured meat production breaks through, we would need to, in that kind of future, replacing all the cows with cultured meat factories, we would need to produce a lot of feed, not for the cow, but for the cells. And we are developing growth media for, for these cells. So at the end, the consumer would have similar kind of food as of today, but then how it arrived on the plate, the technology and pathway supply chain was completely changed, perhaps. And, and, and what does it taste like and what kind of products will you integrate this into? Will it be into uh, bread and pasta and, and how will we consume this? Um, it is very neutral in taste. There's hardly any taste if you add it to, to up to 30% or something like that in food products. Um, you, you can't really taste much. There's a bit umami-like, a bit carrotish uh, flavor, what, uh, what you can taste uh, in it. Uh, it is distinctively yellow. Uh, it has carotenoids, a source of, of vitamin A uh, for, for our body. Um, it will be a protein ingredient in different kinds of food products. So, for example, plant-based meat and dairy do need protein ingredient to have uh, the nutritional value. Um, so it can be there or as a growth media for, for uh, cultured meat production. And uh, what kind of, uh, what, what's the sort of, for people interested in sort of, supporting solar foods uh, and they don't have 10 million dollars to invest in your next you know series b race uh, how, how can people be supporters and follow you on, on this journey and, and and be supportive of, of this shift to a new way of, of producing protein yeah i mean of course there is certain elite time uh, only after which we we are on the market so be be patient but there is something interesting we actually did tell in connection to, to launch, uh, coming public with our, our Series A, which was a detail that when we have our demonstrator running, it will have an experience hub. So kind of a living, living room uh, for the citizens that can come and see the, the new era of food production, but also experience it through different kinds of food product samples uh, that we produce there. Uh, so we want to, to offer this transparency and thereby empower the individual to be part of, a, of the solution rather than part of the problem by making just the good food choices. Wonderful. Um, I, I know we're uh, almost out of time uh, for your session, but uh, if you have the opportunity, please stick around in the chat for a couple of minutes and, uh, and answer questions for, from, from anyone. Uh, and, and folks, uh, please feel free to uh, post questions for Passi in the chat box. Uh, Solar Foods is an exciting uh, new way of, of, of producing uh, protein. So uh, it'll, it'll be really exciting to follow your journey in, in the years to come, Passi. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So uh, everyone, our next uh, little breakout in the breakout, our next little fireside chat will be with our friends, hopefully from the UN in Rome, um, the Office of Industrial Development. Um, and I hope Eleonora and Aurora, you are in this session so that we can add you to the, to the uh, screen. Hello, Aurora and Eleonora from Unido in Rome. Hi there. Hi, hi Daniel. It's a pleasure to be here. It's, it's great to, uh, to have you with us uh, here today. For, for those that don't know Unido, what do you guys actually do? So this is a very interesting question. <laughs> Uh, thank you again for having us here and for giving us the possibility to present a little bit our organization and our activities. So I would say that the main feature of Unido ITPO Italy is that we work very closely with the product sector. And we do that in order to harness the potential of innovation, 
and to achieve our mission that is um, inclusive and sustainable industrial development. So over the past years, we have been scouting and mentoring several startups in the agri and food tech sector from the global south. And since 2015, we have organized three editions of our flagship initiative in this sector, which is a global call for proposals um, called International Award, Innovative Ideas and Technologies in Agribusiness. And this was particularly challenging and interesting because uh, by organizing this initiative, we have been able to compile a database of over 1,000 projects in agri-tech and food tech. And over the years, we've also been able to support many startups from developing countries. And uh, we have done so in compliance with our mandate, which is to act as an honest broker. Therefore, we support these startups by putting them in contact with both um, technical partners, but also investors. Furthermore, which is the reason we're here and we are happy to discuss this further, we, uh, another spillover of this initiative is that we have been able to acquire um, a very interesting knowledge concerning the most pressing challenges in developing countries, but also of the technological trends in place in developing countries to respond to these challenges, but also to seize the opportunities arising from them. And many of these challenges and technological trends are actually um, connected to the relationship between food and the space of the city. So we would like to tell you more about this. And uh, you have some slides to share, but do you want me to share them or you, whatever you prefer? We have actually uh, some sort of slideshow going on <laughs> behind us. We have decided yeah, to, to have the slides. We have okay. a sort of parallel events going on here with our own slideshow. Okay, um, so we'll we'll, uh, we'll stick to that. So uh, you, you spoke about the relationships of food and cities. What about food and cities in in developing countries? What's what's the sort of what what's your take on that? Well, it's very important, first of all, to speak about cities if we want to speak about food. Uh, right now in the world, nowadays, 54% um, of the global population resides in cities. And uh, by 2050, the projection says that there will be the two-thirds of the global population. And 90% of this increase will happen in developing countries, specifically in Asia and in Africa. So uh, this mega cities that will be the product of urbanization have very specific characteristics and especially we already know that in low-income neighborhoods and um, which often are also slums um, it's uh, the people living there usually spend two-thirds of their whole income in purchasing food this makes makes them very reliant on affordable food and also very vulnerable to all the disruptions that can happen in the food supply chain from production to transportation and at the same time, we also see that uh, with urbanization, also diets are shifting. And for instance, is in cities, it's very, it's becoming easier to get processed food, which is um, very easy within reach and also, let's say, cheaper. While nutritious food like uh, vegetables and fruit, it's becoming harder to find and also more expensive. And this leads to health repercussions that are quite severe, like malnutrition, running from stunting to obesity, and at the same time, heart diseases, for instance, or diabetes. And, uh, and also from a climate change point of view, cities are also um, uh, accountable for 70% of global carbon dioxide emissions. And this means that all these kind of challenges at the nexus between food and cities are really important if we want to achieve sustainable development. And for this reason, they have also been incorporated in the sustainable development goals of the United Nations, and especially in SDG number 11. And I, I think you, um, early on, you, you touched upon this award on agribusiness that you've been doing and that you built a large database uh, of, of companies you've engaged with. Can you, can you tell me a bit more about, about that international award on agribusiness? So, uh, as my colleague was saying, this has been our uh, flagship uh, initiative uh, in the scouting startups. And uh, we have been collecting this pool of startups. And thanks to that, besides collecting the startups, we also gained the insights on, on these trends. And um, we just wanted to mention a few, just the most relevant, uh, according also to the topic of the panel. So like 
uh, um, kind of meet, matching the trend and, and some of the startups that we that we see that are doing something to find a solution to these challenges. Um, for instance, the first challenge um, we identified is at the, at the beginning of the food supply chain in agricultural production. Because as we see this very long and complex food chains developing, we also see that there is a lot of room for disruption that can badly affect urban citizens in developing countries. So agricultural production in the city, which is the name of the panel, is, is very important, can be a solution to this. And uh, for instance, an innovation that we scouted is from, uh, was created by a group of architects in South Africa called the Mahali. And the innovation is called Angling Greens. Basically, they, they operate at the nexus between uh, food, energy, waste, and water. So they reuse uh, old tires of cars and, uh, and they use them to, to cultivate plants uh, in a way that makes them possible to cultivate plants basically anywhere. And they also integrate um, this, this basic setup with the technology for uh, uh, fog and condensation that allows them to reuse the water. And at the same time, they integrate compost so they can uh, restore degraded soils. And at the same time, for instance, placing them in, uh, in uh, low-income neighborhoods or living in schools, they can, they can even like, start this culture of like, urban agriculture from very basic needs. Um, a, another challenge, the second, might be on the other side of the uh, food supply chain, which is the last bit, the one of transportation which is often uh, the most polluting, the most inefficient, and the most expensive. So um, startups like Eve Grocer, um, that we scouted in uh, one, our last global yes. call, and also is can currently closing a pre-seed round, uh, decided to solve this problem by constructing an innovative zero-waste subscription model, in which it sets up a calendar of deliveries with their customers and uh, the delivery is mainly of basic commodities and also they um, they reduce plastic packaging a lot because they are able to give the containers and then continue reusing them with their usual customers so this um, in this way in a very um, cost effective way they also uh, manage to be more efficient and reach also areas of the cities that are more remote so so this has been a I'm going to jump in very quickly because another challenge that comes to my mind uh, is one that we have already briefly introduced when we were speaking about the link between the relationship between food and cities. And it is that um, with the increasing urbanization rates, what we found is that there is very often a transition to our more unhealthy diets because of mostly processed foods. So, of course, this means uh, diets that are rich in sugar, that are rich in oils and fats. And a way to both prevent it and correct this trend is that uh, is by promoting um, affordable, uh, sustainable, but also uh, healthy food. And one of the companies that we have scouted over the years, uh, actually, um, through the international award, but we also involved them in uh, one of our projects in Mozambique, is a company from Mozambique that is called Finana, that produces a 100% green banana flour that doesn't contain gluten or sugar. And it's very important because it has, uh, we can say, um, a threefold impact. Because on one hand, perfectly in line with our mandate, it, uh, it's a way to uh, provide added value to the banana value chain, that is what we do. Um, secondly, it is a way to prolong the shelf life of bananas from, two day, from nine days for the fruit to uh, almost two years with the flower. And maybe more importantly, it is uh, a locally sourced ingredient that prevents both undernutrition and obesity. Therefore, it has so many health benefits when it is included in locally diets, but maybe also diets at the international level. And well, to conclude, just on the last uh, issue, which is food waste, and it's a global issue. But as we see, 70% of global food waste can, actually comes from cities. And uh, another solution that we scouted from South Africa that is called AgriProtein, uh, decided to solve this through insects. So actually, they, they use compost to uh, feed black soldier fly alver, 
I, I run <laughs> our yeah. it's a kind of context. And what the, then like are harvested when they grow up to create three different products. One is a fertilizer from uh, for agricultural productions. Another one is a purified fat oil, and then the other one is for animal feed, also solving another big issue of like food for animal feed. So these and, are just the most relevant trends, just to name a few. And, 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 and speaking about these uh, startups and, and private sector companies you engage with in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, can, can you talk a bit about cold hubs? Because they're uh, in a minute or so, I'm, I'm bringing America yes. online to, to pitch. So what's your relationship with cold hubs? So we actually had the possibility to touch base with cold hubs because of COVID. Because uh, to respond to the challenges posed by COVID-19, we launched back in June a call for proposals that was called Global Call, Innovative Ideas and Technologies for Developing Countries. And it had one category just for food and agriculture, since it was one of the industries that was hit the hardest by the pandemic. And Cold Ops was the winner of this category because it provided an innovative solution to prolong the shelf life for fresh produce, which was, of course, particularly interesting because of the restrictions of movement that were enforced during the pandemic to contain the virus. So, we are very happy to leave the floor to them to tell you more about this, about their innovative solution and how they want to change the trends in storing fresh produce in developing countries, but all over the world. Great, wonderful. Uh, Aurora, Eleonora, I wish I could speak uh, to you uh, for a lot, lot longer because I know you do a lot of impactful things in building a global ecosystem, connecting Western companies with uh, really cool startups and other actors in, in emerging uh, countries. So thank you so much. Please stick around in the chat if people have questions regarding Unido and your work. Uh, so thank you for coming on today. Mille grazie. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. And um, we will bring on Cold Hubs. And uh, we have with us Nameka Ikeguonu. Uh, of Nigeria. Uh, good, Hi, afternoon. Nigeria. good afternoon. Nice to be here. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. I hope you can hear me very well. We, my, uh, screen. Uh, we hear you perfectly and everyone uh, feel free to double click on, on the on the screen on this uh, shared screen to make it larger. So the floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening from wherever you are listening. Over the next three minutes, I will share some insight in the work we are doing with Code Hubs, uh, deploying solar-powered working code rooms to preserve fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, but real quickly, as an introduction, my name is Indameki Kewono. I'm a farmer, a radio broadcaster, and a social entrepreneur. Uh, as a radio broadcaster, I built a radio station about uh, 15 years ago, and I traveled through the length and breadth of Nigeria, sitting down with uh, smallholder farmers who identify challenges and opportunities within the agricultural space. And it was in the course of my travels, actually, that I identified a problem that 45% uh, of food is lost due to lack of cold storage at key points within the food supply chain. And this problem affects an estimated 93 million smallholder farmers and other food supply chain actors in Nigeria who lose 25% of their income. You know, this absence of infrastructure has become a norm that you actually travel through the highways of Nigeria and you see food dumped on the roadside because of the inability to store and uh, extend the shelf life to a significant amount of uh, days. So in 2015, myself and uh, several other colleagues founded Code Hubs as a company that designs, builds, commissions, operates and maintains 100% solar powered working code rooms. Uh, these code rooms are specially designed for installation in farm clusters, produce aggregation centers, and outdoor food markets. But the ultimate goal is to use those code rooms to actually extend the shelf life of food from two days to 21 days, making more nutritious, safe, hygienic food available for both urban dwellers consumption, but for sale in the outdoor markets too. So, uh, because aside the fact that we are trying to create a social impact, we also created a little bit of a business behind it by promoting what we call pay as you store 
and we are charging farmers, retailers, and wholesalers just about 50 US cents equivalent in the local currency to store one of those 20 kilogram plastic crates filled up with any amount of food inside the cold room for one night. So over the past three years, we were able to build 24 hubs. Uh, last year, we saved 20,400 tons of food from spoilage, signing up 3,517 users and creating 28 new jobs for women as our hub operators. You know, having created this little bit of success, we are now expanding throughout Nigeria. We have 30 cold rooms we are building at the moment, and we expect to close 2020 with 54 cold hubs all across the country and prepare to expand to other African countries. So in a nutshell, that is what we are doing at Cold Hubs, which uh, I wanted to share with uh, listeners all across the world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. If, if, um, if people uh, around the world want to be supportive to your work, what's the best way uh, for them to engage with you? Or they can reach me by email. Uh, there are several options that people can support. We organize educational classes. We call it the post-service management educational class uh, for farmers, and we teach them everything from best practices in harvesting to the financial benefit of having high-quality food available for sale in the market. You know, uh, people can also support our expansion all across this country. Uh, there are 200 million people in this country, so. Having 54 cold hubs is not going to make a lot of a difference. There are so many mouths to feed in Nigeria. So we, we are still planning to grow within the Nigerian space significantly. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I wish we had more time. Uh, I encourage everyone to check out the work on our cold hubs. Um, trying to solve an incredibly important problem where 30-40% of, of uh, food is, is lost before it reaches the consumer. Uh, so, if you want to join the mission of saving a lot of tomatoes in Nigeria and other places, <laughs> you know where to go. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, our next uh, startup to pitch is Gourmet from Paris, France. And uh, with us, we have Nicolas. Uh, yeah. Bonjour and welcome. And uh, I think you should be able to share your screen. Yeah, we will cross over screen, uh, hopefully. On your... Sure, let me know if it works. It works fine, and uh, everyone feel free to double click to make the video larger. So the floor is yours. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Well, hi, everyone. Very happy to be on stage and tell you more about our journey at, at Gourmet. So just last year, on, on this day that, you, that you're seeing on your screen, the city of New York in the US took a bold decision against a very famous French delicacy that I'm sure you know, and you can now easily guess. I'm talking about foie gras. New York City actually decided to simply ban this product, prohibit this delicacy because of a reason, and this is the reason. So this is called force feeding, and I had to kind of blur the image because this is very unpleasant to watch, but this is really how foie gras, how this delicacy is produced all around the globe. In fact, more than $2 billion uh, of foie gras are actually sold on the market every single year. And it's not only massive in France and in Spain, like you may think, but also growing in Japan and as well as in China. So the context is here is that we have a growing and high margin market, premium market, with decreasing supply as more and more countries are simply banning the production for ethical reasons. And it's the case of, of Sweden, for instance. So in fact, 17 countries have banned the production. So I'm not sure I can think of any other uh, as controversial food as, as foie gras. So now just imagine if we could come up with a completely cruelty-free alternative that is as delicious as the obsolete, let's say, and controversial version. Well, this is exactly what we do at Gourmet. My name is Nicholas, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Gourmet, and we are developing the first feel-good foie gras with one purpose in mind, simply to untangle this delicacy from controversy and allow, enable chefs all around the globe to tell proud stories and stories of innovation, of resilience, without worrying too much about you know, what's behind the scenes. So what do we do that? How do we do that, sorry? It starts with this egg. It's actually a duck egg, a white big duck egg. And we isolate a few duck, egg, duck cells sorry, from the, an egg like this one. We give these cells the very best feed and the best environment 
So they, they can essentially do what they like to do is drawing as soon as they have the best environment. So they multiply and they multiply again. We then give the cells good healthy plant-based fats to replicate the effect of force feeding at the cell level. So yes, we do force feed, but we do not force feed the animals. We only force feed the cells. And we eventually use food science techniques to give the cells the right shape and texture. So now if we take a step back, we um, have already managed to replicate the unique texture of foie gras. And this is on, on this slide, one of our first and early prototypes that you can see, and we keep iterating and it keeps getting better and better. So now foie gras is only the very beginning of our journey. Uh, beyond this product and starting with the same cells, that is important to keep in mind, starting with the same cells, our cell production platform will allow us to craft any kind of duck or chicken meat products. And our ambition is truly global and we want to lead this upcoming agricultural revolution of cultured and sustainable meat, so meat produced by animal cells, cell cultured cells. And this is essentially one of the biggest and most pressing issues of our time. Just sharing one single number here, 400 and million tons. This is the global meat consumption in the next decade, so by 2050. And this is a 50% increase compared to today. And sadly, uh, well, the, the sad news is that the current production methods, so intensive farming, for instance, will not be able to meet this growing protein demand because these are not efficient methods and these are not sustainable methods. So cultured meat is not the only solution, but it's definitely one of the most promising solutions to supplement conventional agriculture and meet the grain demand. And well, in a nutshell, the entire process of culturing directly cells is much less resource intensive and much more efficient as you kind of directly grow what you eat. When you eat a cut of meat, when you eat foie gras or duck nugget or whatever, you are already eating cells. So, well, our take is that why not grow directly the cells that you eat instead of growing the, the entire animals? And to conclude a few last words about Gourmet, so we are now a team of 12 people. We are based in Paris, in France. We started just last year. And we're a group of highly uh, skilled scientists, engineers, food scientists as well, supporting by leading institutions as well as investors. So please, if you are a cell biologist, if you are a bioprocess engineer, if you are a food engineer with a passion for the field of cultured meat, or also if you are a chef willing to try and play with our product, please get in touch. And here is my email. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nicolas. Uh, this is really fascinating. I, I know this is a question that all the cell ag startup founders hate to get, but when do, when do you think uh, we'll be able to buy this at restaurants, um, you know, in, 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 in Europe, in, in, in North America and so on? Sure. So it's, yeah, actually a good question. One of the, of the most common question indeed. But the, the thing is that it's not that easy to understand because we rely on regulatory approvals. So there's this kind of uncertainty between the moment that we will apply for a market approval and the moment that it will be granted. But our, our ambition is really to get to market between 2023 and 2024. Wonderful. Well, uh, there you have it, everyone. If you want to uh, save a lot of ducks and goose uh, and geese from being force-fed um, while being able to eat foie gras with a clean conscience, uh, this is perhaps the future. So, Nicolas, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Really fascinating. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So, um, our next and actually final speaker uh, for this session is uh, Sarah Farley joining us from uh, New York. She's the managing director of the Food Initiative of the Rockefeller Foundation. And... Uh, this session is about producing food in the cities, and uh, hopefully we'll we'll get to uh, talk about that as well. Um, Sarah, it's great to have you here. Oh, thanks, Daniel. What a treat to chat with you, listen to all these amazing innovators, and and really think about envisioning tomorrow's urban food systems. So um, we'll get to urban food systems in a second. But speaking about visions, why has the Rockefeller Foundation? run this Food System Vision Prize for the last year? Well, you know, we looked around and so many of the portrayals of the future are really dark, 
truly dystopian, you know, and, and it's hard to find the hope and the courage to muster a vision for tomorrow when what we've become so good at depicting are really dreadful portrayals of what 2030, 2040, 2050 will be for a host of, of really incredibly um, important but depressing issues. So we wanted to spark hope. We really wanted to change the narrative. And we also wanted to get a sense of the diversity of aspirations for tomorrow that hail from unique those cities, whole countries or, or regions. And it really was this opportunity to invite innovators anywhere to become protagonists in their own future. So that was really the rationale. So uh, you announced this food system vision price. Uh, what, what was the response? Uh, did anyone submit a vision? <laughs> you know, we, we'd hoped we'd get a few. Um, it actually, it exceeded our wildest dreams. We got 1,300 unique submissions for portrayals of food system visions for the year 2050. And what's incredible is those 1,300 submissions actually reflect more than 4,000 separate companies, restaurants, producer organizations, governmental entities, universities that built different types of teams to put forward their ideas. So it was a really spectacular response. And also those 1300 teams straddled almost 120 countries too. So just, you know, the, the voices came from every corner of the globe. Yeah, so where did these visions come from? Were they mostly from North America and Europe? You know, actually, Africa alone had 500 submissions, and the region actually had the most submissions of, of any other. So truly, truly global, yeah. And the, the theme for today's session uh, this afternoon, at least this afternoon in Sweden, has been producing in the city. So did some of these uh, food system missions focus on food production in the cities? Yeah, absolutely. About 50%, if you look at the semi-finalists, and the semi-finalists were 76 of those uh, 1,300 submissions, about 50% focused on an area, be that Beijing or Lagos, Nigeria, Lima, uh, etc. And, and what kind of challenges uh, did these uh, visionaries see in terms of uh, urban areas and, and, and food? Are there challenges that are probably familiar to most anyone living in a city today? You know, some were for were site specific. So fires such as in, in the Pacific Northwest in the United States, droughts as we see across the, the Sahel and elsewhere. But, but, you know, that was typified by uh, pointing to just extreme weather events and changing climate. Also more pollution in, in the urban arena, more stress and strain on city resources, city infrastructure, um, more congestion, more traffic, a sense that middle-class job creation opportunities were being stressed, especially in the context of COVID, where are the opportunities, where are the jobs, that really shined through. As well, when you look at the environmental dimension, you know, a, a lot of cities are talking about just the encroachment on the very few spaces for biodiversity, the lush green spaces in cities being minimized and overtaken um, by urban sprawl. And then when it came to diet, just so many of these cities are seeing the same tsunami of diet-related diseases connected to just an onslaught of packaged, processed foods that just aren't good for us, but are becoming the mainstay of a lot of urban diet. So what kind of solutions did these visions, uh, you know, outline? Yeah, it is so much diversity, so many solutions. And I encourage anyone listening to check check out these visions because they're giving so many cues for investable innovations and technologies. This is really a gold mine and all the data is open, available for anyone uh, via the Rockefeller website over to the IDEO platform. But um, with that plug, a, a few of the sort of main buckets, you know, definitely a lot of technologies around reducing food loss and waste a lot of technologies around creating data resources that enable more open um, 
open data transparency, collaboration, data-driven approaches to bring more efficiency and precision to agriculture. You also saw a fair amount of solutions that are really focusing on the, the consumer demand and the behavioral adoption toward plant-based uh, or planetary diet. Um, and then you're seeing mechanisms like urban food hubs or local food hubs, not only as production areas within the context of the cities, but also serving as distribution centers or kitchen labs, community learning centers, you know, spaces that are really serving as social meeting spots. So those, those are a few of the main buckets. And, and you're talking a lot about technology. So was that mostly from sort of Silicon Valley type of uh, vision teams or where do these ideas come from? No, they're they're actually really universal, and that that's what's so interesting. You know, I think these technologies are appealing because they can transcend boundaries. They all need to be localized. They all need to be grafted into culture. But I'll give you two examples: one from Nigeria and one from Kenya, just to give a sense of how some of these um, more like Silicon Valley sounding technologies are really integrated in a picture that is local for for 2050. So. In Nairobi, there's one vision called the 2050 vision for Nairobi. They're looking a lot at peri-urban farming and what are the innovation opportunities in that space and, and thinking about bringing in both precision agriculture, but also just biotechnology to supply cities with food. Um, a lot of that vision is also around indoor farming, aquaculture, and then they're looking at digital. You know how how we can bring digital technologies to enable intelligent food distribution, but really empower consumers to make informed choices, both through personalized nutrition, but you know also through artificial intelligence-based uh, solutions. And then, of course, the Nairobi vision had a fair amount of drones, universal automation. They were also including um, constructs like three D printing. 3D printing both for restaurants, but also for hospitals and for schools. So a lot of, lot of really exciting gems, that vision offering and, as well, a, um, just an example from Lagos. So there they're looking at, you know, blockchain, of course, for the transparency, the, the traceability offering that it provides, but again, bringing in big data, sensing technologies, both for like better crop prediction, but also to protect food quality and, and bring about that personalized nutrition opportunity. So, you know, I think in some, what you're seeing is people all over the world, they're dreaming for a better food system. They see technology, they see innovation as tools for it, but really importantly, they see the culture shift the policy changes and and the, the sort of will needed to bring these changes about as well so so now that you've selected the sort of top 10 visions what's what's next they are in a fantastic accelerator right now being executed by our, our colleague partners, implementing partners, Open IDEO and Second Muse with another group called the Guild of Future Architects. And it's, it's really a three-part focus for this rather unique accelerator because it's not a technology accelerator, it's an accelerator of a vision for systems change for 2050. It's really three parts. One is around uh, identifying stakeholders and working on engagement strategies for those stakeholders. The second piece is, is really about storytelling. How do you tell a story for systems change that mobilizes movements? And the third aspect is about action planning. You know, you can talk about 2050, but how do you consolidate that to a set of actions that you take for the next three years so that this really becomes a, a reality? So they've got their work cut out for them. Um, and then on the other side of that, next year is just a watershed year with this United Nations Food Systems Summit. So we're really thinking about preparing these visionaries to take the stage of the summit and really build that global movement around their ideas that we think they deserve. Fantastic. And, and uh, I know we're almost we're past the hour or two minutes. So any final words before wrapping up the session? Oh, just, you know, quickly, I think it's easy to get really um, deflated when looking at the, the picture of our news, our presidential debates, you name it. Um, and so when seeking hope, it is so reassuring to see the 
true beauty of these visions, the inspiration, the feasibility, and the transformation that's being beckoned for by these amazing groups around the world. And I'm sure most of the people listening to this session today are just those kinds of folks. So check out the prize. Thanks, Daniel, for this wonderful opportunity to chat about it. No, thank you, Sarah, for, for joining. We, we really appreciate it. And best of luck with the Food System Vision Prize. Thanks, Daniel. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. So uh, that's all, folks. We had a, a really intense two-hour session of startups pitching of, um, of uh, multilateral agencies like the UN in Rome, uh, philanthropies like the Rockefeller Foundation in New York, um, fantastic startups. Um, it's been a really fun session. Uh, but the fun is not over. Uh, if you head over to, I think, the reception here, there's, uh, there's a mingle where you can meet with other participants uh, of Sweden Food Tech Big Meet. Uh, so you can continue to network and uh, have fun. And of course, this session has been recorded and will be shared in due time. So uh, sign up for uh, Sweden Food Tech uh, newsletters and social media, and you'll be sure to be notified. So thank you, everyone, so much for joining the session today. Bye.